think I'm a bit taller than this. <laughs> the big one. I'm yeah. still taller than this. I used to be this height, but then I was like maybe seven or eight or something. Oh, right, that's as tall as I can get to be. I used to be thin as well. I actually, this is my friend, Mike Stan, I used to be as thin as him. Does the microphone make any difference at all? Because I've got quite a quiet voice anyway. So th that was a lovely story. Thank, thank you very much. I was going to use this uh, stool, but I actually need a safety net, and I see the safety nets over there, so that's not much good, really. <laughs> but if I did collapse, I could eat some uh, strawberries at the same time. That'd be very handy. <laughs> very thoughtful of you. I was also thinking as I was sat there, I hope someone, it's a lovely garden, but I hope they've actually looked at the roof and if it will hold up or not, okay? So if we, maybe we bounce up and down on the count of three and see if we survive. If we're dead, that probably suggests that it's not strong enough. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a vote for this, take a vote for the jumping up and down. Hands up, who wants to die now? <laughs> Just the two really old people, I like that, okay? So, uh, so I'm actually 108, so I'm a bit older than you. And, uh, but I did learn something about my funeral because I said in, from, in my, what's that, will it's called, I've said that when I die and have that funeral thing, I want people to have ice cream and jelly because I thought that would be quite nice. But now I'm going to change it to vegan ice cream and jelly. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Sid Oslid, but to be honest, that's not my real name. My real name is Doogly Woogly Agogo. And uh, it took me a long time to realize that Doogly Woogly Agogo actually could actually be Welsh. So I, I'm not Welsh, I'm Scottish, so I changed it to, to Sid Oslid by default. Uh, <laughs> which is a shame, really, because I wanted to be called Violet, but well, but name had already been taken by someone else. So, so I'm going to read a little bit from this book. Uh, I'll tell you a bit of a story about the book because you're meant to tell stories. And then I'll actually read from the book because it actually is a story. So you get two stories for the price of nothing. Uh, and the book is, called, the book is called Mr. Elastic Brain, The Life and Poems of Sid Oslid, which of course is myself. And it's in four parts. Part one, part two, part three, and ah, uh, part four. And it's part four I'm going to read later on, okay? And I might read a little bit from part one. So part one uh, and part two, I think, who knows? There's a whole bit, whole stuff about me performing as an entertainer. Uh, and there's stuff in there about my mental health problems, because the book that I did write, I think, in two, um, 2010 or something, all the profits for this book goes to mind for mental health, better mm -hmm. mental health. And I really wanted to support that because I had some problems. I'll speak a little bit about it. And uh, I'm going to read a story at the end, which is actually about me doing a gig in London at the Poetry, uh, in Covent Garden, the Poetry Society. It's the first gig I'd done for a number of years, so I was under quite a lot of pressure, but I managed it. So I'm going to tell you, read about that a bit later on. If I jump back, not to my birth, because I, I was there, but I just can't remember it. It's amazing. So I can't remember the birth bit, but I remember being born in Glasgow and, and being four pounds. So twice your weight, but still very small, and I've grown into some sort of obese monster. And I was there till I was three, then I went up to uh, Site Dingwall, and I went to school when I was four because they make you go to school very young. And I loved school, school was just ace, because I just played all the time. And then they tried to teach me stuff, and it was less ace, because I couldn't do it. And then, <laughs> they moved to, then my parents moved to Aberdeen, so I became an Aberdonian, which is quite nice, because when you're in Aberdeen, it's quite nice to be an Aberdonian, or else people don't speak to you. <laughs> And I came here and went to school, and it took a long, long time for me to, I think I was about 30 when I realized I was dyslexic, which is why I was so bad at school. I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't learn anything. But when I was at school, it wasn't called dyslexia, it was called thick as shit's here. So, <laughs> and I fitted that profile really, really well, right? really, really well. And uh, I now actually think it might have been dyspraxia, because our youngest son has been diagnosed with dyspraxia, and all, a lot of things he has, I had as well. But, doesn't matter now, it's about dealing with it. It's not about what you have, it's about how you manage it. So uh, that's, in this book is actually an award-winning poem from the British Society of Dyslexia, which is very, very nice. They gave me an award for the adult category, which is not content, it's just actual age. So that's in there, that's in there as well. So um, the other thing I did was, because I couldn't do school, I had this really fertile imagination, but couldn't do anything with it because I didn't understand what was happening at school at all. And I used to get sent off on a Saturday morning, which basically I just realized as an excuse for my parents to have sex, we used to get. And I only realized it recently because my mum, we, we stayed in Holland for a long time. My mum came to visit and we were at the beach and she drank lots of wine. And she told us about Anne Summers parties from the 70s, which was a lady with a suitcase with garments and toys and stuff. And she used to host these things and she'd go to people's houses. And she said she was at this Anne Summers party, they'll be drinking wine. And all the ladies were talking about how, how many times uh, they actually did it, it with their husbands. 
uh, once a week, once a month, once a year, birthdays, that kind of stuff. And of course, my mum wouldn't say anything, and eventually, come on, and she, so she actually owned up every night and most mornings, right? <laughs> so my mum, who's now 85, told my wife and I that while she was drunk, and we were like, oh, this is really good, this is really good. So now I realise that every night and most mornings was her sending us off to the Odeon cinema on a Saturday morning to watch, <laughs> to watch uh, children's movies and silent movies and comedy movies. And my life became those movies. That's what I identified with. And I also identified with it on a Saturday and Sunday afternoon on television when they showed all black and white movies. And it was all comedy movies. I was absorbed by the whole thing. I loved all that. But I couldn't do school. And they did drama at school. And I couldn't do drama because I couldn't coordinate myself, which is why I think that dyspraxia thing comes around. I couldn't coordinate myself. I couldn't speak. I spoke with a stutter. I got sent off for elocution lessons to learn how to speak. Uh, but I loved the whole dramatic thing. So I put my hand up one day when they came along and said, who wants to go to children's theater being run at the art center in Aberdeen? And all these really smart kids and talented kids said, me, 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 me. Uh, me, please, me, would you like to go? So they said something along the lines of, fuck off, you're shit, you're stupid, you can't come. Uh, which is, I think, what I heard at the age of six. And I went home and told my dad, I really want to do this. And he wrote a letter and I got to go. And of course, when I got there, they were correct. I was no good, but I really, <laughs> and I couldn't dance, I couldn't speak, and I couldn't do stuff, but I really, really, really enjoyed it. And I probably did it for, I think, nine years until I had to leave school. I just did it and did it, and every Saturday, it was the best part of my week. School was just like, ah, what's all this? And although I played a lot of football at school, I could, do, I could do that quite well. No, I couldn't. I could stop other people playing football, which is, we still get you a game, right? So I did that, and on a Saturday, I go down to the art center, and get taught to meditate and taught to think things up and taught to express myself and slowly come out of myself very, very, very slowly. And I loved that. But of course, then I couldn't get any qualifications. So at a certain age, like maybe 38, I'd say you must leave school now, go away. So, so at the age of 16, I had to leave school because that's what you do if you can't do stuff. And I had no drama to do. So I went and did amateur dramatics. I thought I'll do amateur dramatics. And I signed up for amateur dramatics. I went along and it was adults drinking and having affairs. Now, I didn't drink. <laughs> I didn't drink, and I didn't want to have an affair. I just wanted to shag the girl up the road, and she was not talking to me at all, right? So, I mean, like, so I said, no way I was going to shag anybody. It's far too shy, and uh, no way I was going to drink lots of alcohol. So eventually I thought, I'll just make up my own character. So I made up Sid Ozilid, based on some of my heroes from television and from movies. I won't tell you who they are, but if you buy the book, you'll find out. So, and, I mean, I'm not forcing you, but I've got several thousand units to shift in the back of the car, so please come up. <laughs> No, that's a joke, I don't. Right, so, uh, so I made up my own character, Sid Oslid, just to get to perform, to be myself. So, because my outlet had been cut off. And of course, nowadays you get these spoken word events. But then there was no spoken word events, there was just words that were spoken. So I used to go and do gigs, uh, which were just gigs. So the gigs I wanted to go to, which were normally at the 62 Club or at Ruffles or different places, I went along and said I want to perform. So I ended up doing gigs with people like The Clash, or the specials, or OMD, or different people. Uh, and getting to go to Glasgow, and Edinburgh, and London. I got to go and perform in Paris at the Moulin Rouge. Got to go on television. I got my own radio show for five years. I did a whole bunch of stuff, uh, just because I needed to go and do stuff. Does that make sense? And of course, I got myself a day job, and I worked very, very hard. And I wasn't very good at the day job, but I learned that if you work hard, they like it, and they give you money. So any job I got, I just turned up and worked really, really hard during the day. I'm going to go off in the evening and just do this bizarre stuff out of my head just to be myself. And I did that for many, many years. And then the mental health thing happened after I got divorced. So I had a nice wife and I had three lovely children. And it's what they call uh, a friendly divorce. She was friendly with somebody else, so we got divorced. <laughs> hey, woo -woo. I just made that up. I thought it was quite good. Right, so... Uh, <laughs> write that down. Use that next month. So, uh, and that was quite easy because... We, she was a nice lady, but we didn't have a relationship. We just did stuff. But what I hadn't realized is, if you, I didn't realize how important it was for me to be with my children. So that couldn't handle that. I ended up having a really bad uh, mental breakdown and lots of major, major, major problems with my mental health. Re lots of pain inside. And I convinced myself that if you cut yourself, the pain flies out your body, right? Now that, in theory, it sounds perfect. I would suggest to you, do not do it. It does not work, okay? <laughs> If you don't believe it, come round, I'll show you, okay? The pain does not fly out your body. Some blood and some other stuff flies out your body, but the emotional pain does not fly out your body if you cut yourself, okay? I also decided it'd be quite good to kill myself on several occasions, but I found that quite painful too, right? <laughs> I wasn't like that fellow who tried it and messed up. I was like, 
try different things. Oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. So, uh, <laughs> but what I did do was I convinced myself, hmm, what would my children think if their dad wasn't here? And that really, really changed my mind. Every time I got very, very close and had it all organized, what impact will this have on my children? And that always stopped me. There's, there's always something which make, turns you around. So I hadn't been performing for a while, and then Facebook was invented, and I wanted to speak to my three teenage children, or my three children, uh, and I was staying in Holland at the time, and they were all on Facebook. So they said, Dad, you must use Facebook to communicate with us. So I learned how to use Facebook to stay in touch with my kids. And of course, each time that the, uh, the platform changes, I've got to change. So it's like, we don't use Facebook anymore now, you've got to use WhatsApp. We don't use WhatsApp anymore, you've got to use Instagram. So as, as they evolve, I've got to, as an old man, learn how to use these things. And I was doing that, and more and more people came along and said, hello Sid, how are you, are you doing gigs? And I wasn't doing gigs. And then a man called uh, Ian Slater, so Ian Slater, some of you will know, uh, he sang in a band called APB that were very successful in the States, and he's now the sound man for Pete Doherty and the Libertines. So uh, he contacted me and said, come to my house, record some stuff, and you must start performing. And through time I decided, because people prompted me, was to write this book. So I wrote the book, and that's why the money went to better mental health. But it also made me realize that by being yourself, you can actually heal yourself. So do the thing that's most powerful to yourself. So I went, off, I went off, did lots lots of gigs just to promote this book. But I realized how much fun it was. I did it for a number of years. I got back on the radio. I was on the radio every week with Tom Morton doing my poetry. train. I would fly to London every week for work. And I'd go off and do gigs in London. There are very big events then. Spoken word had been invented. So I'd play in front of two or three hundred people. And it was really cool because just some old man would turn up and do some stuff. So I did that and that was nice. So I'm going to read a little bit from the book, which is me going to do my first gig in a number of years in London. Uh, and I, and I, because of the mental health problems I had, I thought I'll go and check out the venue the night before to make sure I know where I'm going. So I did that. And then when I went there, I got lost, which comes up in the story. And then <laughs> and I had to sit in this dark room, which felt like for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And all I wanted to do was go on and perform, but I just was ready to burst by the time I got my chance. So I'll read that, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been doing recently, and then I'll sit down. Ah, here is Matthew. There we go. Matthew is our youngest son. I have five children with a 30-year gap between them. This is Matthew. He's, uh, he performed with me on Monday in Edinburgh, which is very nice. So I think two weeks ago I performed in Paris. First time in 30 years. The following week I performed in Amsterdam. Monday with, in Edinburgh, and Matthew came up and recited one of my poems. I've been learning my poems again, and he learns them in the back of the car, I realize, so he wanted to perform. And tonight we're here, the best gig of them all, and in a week and a half we're in New York. So that's Matthew who's been used as a place mark. So, Poetry Cafe, Covent Garden, London Town, September 2010. When in London town, I thought it a good idea to go and perform at the Poetry Cafe in Covent Garden. They have an open mic night on Tuesdays called Poetry Unplugged. Not wishing to appear as an out-of-towner, I walked to the Poetry Cafe on the Monday evening to ensure I knew its location. It's a good idea, really. Go the night before, check it all out. I'm sorted. I'm ready to go. Just say goodbye to the sheep and I'm in there. The marvellous eight-minute walk, eight minutes to the Poetry, from my accommodation, it's actually beside overlooking the London Eye, obviously paid for by my company, not me, <laughs> so, on the embankment. It was only a five minute return journey. When you know where you're going, much easier to come back. Five minute return journey. Heavy downpour of rain, I had no jacket. I also stepped into a deep puddle of water <sighs> at the traffic lights when trying to avoid a waterfall of many colors that was directed in my direction by a nice red London bus. So raining, sunny, rainbow, horrible wet. Tuesday night, tonight of the gig. Interested poets have to sign in between six and seven. Now we all know that if you do poetry, you gotta be there in time. It's a bit like comedy, really. Comedy is like, it's all about timing, right? The gig starts at seven, you arrive at eight, crap timing. You gotta be there, you gotta be there at the right time. Okay? I made that up as well, I made that down too. Right, that's good. So it's two ad libs I'm gonna use in the future, right? So. In preparation, I wrote out the address, again, of the poetry calf on a yellow sticky and printed out a few poems. You've got to take your poems along. Yeah? I thought, uh, I thought they may well, these poems may well fit in with the learned folk of London town. Wishing to impress with my personal hygiene, I hopped into the shower and ran through my poems. That's what you do. You go in the shower, you practice a lot. I don't know. 
That's how all poets rehearse, by the way, with or without the water being on. Okay? All right. I left the embankment at 17.55. Makes sense. It's only a five-minute walk. I'm sorted. I'm going to be there a whole hour before any other poets. I'm going to be the first one there. I struck out for the poetry cafe. It would be my first time on stage in years. Still no jacket, but feeling rather focused, I took the wrong turning and became more and more confused. Just what you need with a man with mental health problems. As I wandered along brightly lit streets filled with noise and tourists, probably from Scotland actually, I was getting more and more confused. I longed to be at home in my croft with my invisible friends, Jimmy the sheep, Robert the cat, and Mickey the monkey, who is not invisible, but a very good friend. I, <laughs> it's true, I actually have Mickey the monkey. I've had Mickey the monkey for 45 years now. Uh, this was when I remembered that if you are going to write an address in advance, it's a good idea to take it with you. I left a yellow sticky behind. Silly foolish boy. If you want directions, ask a policeman. I asked two separate policemen. Both had no idea uh, what I was talking about and said it was their first night in Covent Garden. It must be a rough area if policemen only last one night and have to be changed, laid to rest and used as sleeping policemen. Can I believe it? Ask a policeman. I don't know. I'm only, it's my first night here. I'll ask him. I don't know why their first night here. Rubbish service. Right, I did see Mick Jones from The Clash. Very true, he's Mick Jones, right? Walked past me and I was rather scooped, as you would be. If anyone sees Mick Jones from The Clash, he's going, it's said, no, it's not Mick Jones. Right, he was with some young dude with cool hair. So Mick and I are both very bald, so anybody with hair has got cool hair. Otherwise, he may have rushed over and asked for my autograph uh, and maybe even given me directions. But I did not want to embarrass him and, I, and anyway, he had his chance of the autograph in 1977 and 1982. I did find the, the venue by asking another cafe where it was, and I was 30 seconds away from the venue. I went in, it took me an hour and 15 minutes to get there, a five minute walk. <laughs> the whole list was of all the poets had signed up. There was no space for me, but they felt sorry for me because I was crying a bit. If you, get, if you get stuck, if you get stuck, weep openly in public, right? And people, no problem, come in, come in, get your name down. Yeah, sucker. So I got, so I got to perform, right? <laughs> and they said, you might be on in the second half, no problem. Get a cup of cake, get some uh, coffee, go downstairs, sit downstairs. Each poet goes on, there's 25 poets, 25 poets doing five minutes a poem. Oh my goodness. So as they go on, I'm actually in need of an oxygen tent. I'm getting more and more nervous. My heart is pumping, 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 pumping. I need a pacemaker and I rub down with my favorite silk scarf. Mmm, silk scarf. <laughs> right, each poet goes up and does their stunning work, plugging their next gig or selling their latest book. I started to think that staying at home and watching Scotland play football very, very badly would have been a much better idea for my health and my heart rate. Which actually would have been, I got beaten by the way, but uh, I had no book, no next gig, and could not remember the words to any of my poems, and I left all the bits of paper back in the <coughs> hotel. So, two and a half hours in the hot, dark room, no problem for me. Turns out I'm on the second half, and what they do is they give each person a name of some sort of horror character, and the audience shouts out who they want to come on next, so you don't know when you're going to go on. They're not having performed for a number of <coughs> years, feeling very, very pressurized, left all my poems back in the hotel. I just want to go on stage. All right, so they're shouting out, Dracula, and then whoever is associate, Dracula comes up, Wolfman, and Wolfman comes up, Hunchback. So eventually, the last person to go on of the 25 poets is me, right? And I'm just about ready to die. So the audience thought I was very funny. Not because I was, but because I told them that I got lost, left my directions behind, as well as my poetry, and asked two policemen for directions. Luckily for me, I did not share the fact that I'd left over an hour earlier. <laughs> so, what did happen was I gave them three poems, and people thought it was very, very funny, very, very witty, and they invited me upstairs in the poetry cafe to buy me a drink. But they were so swatty, I was a bit shy, and I didn't go upstairs for the drink, which is a shame, really, because I could have made some contacts and what have you and felt better for myself. But I didn't do that, so I decided I would strike off home, look back, remember how I got lost, it would take me five minutes to go home. Guess what happened? Three and a half hours <laughs> it took me to get home, right? I just got so excited, I got really panicky, I was getting very disordered. disordered. Anyway, so, feeling somewhat pleased with myself, here we go. This is oh yes. 
So, as I was wandering around, some nice young men who called themselves a posse stopped me in the street and asked where I got my lovely shirt from. Now, and would I like the garment, and would, and they, could I give them this, this fine garment? I explained I got it in Holland for my birthday and that it may not be available in London town. The young men suggested they remove it from my person for their own use. My goodness! Word of my performance has spread so fast, it was faster than the fire of London. And people were not only content with shaking my hand and applauding, they also wanted a bit of the Oslid wardrobe. It only took me a few seconds to explain to the young gents that as nice as it was of them to follow me into a dark underpass, I would need to keep my shirt as I had no vest or indeed jacket to keep me warm. We exchanged some strange dialogue. Theirs being a variety I would imagine could be found in the streets of London town. And my more poetic but surprisingly aggressive overtones being somewhat more of the Scottish variety, <laughs> the young men kindly left once they understood that as large as I am, the four of them would never fit into my shirt. <laughs> Back in my room, the adrenaline was still flowing, so I decided to entertain the minibar. Once all the food and drink was finished, I felt it only proper to visit the Japanese gent in the next room and tell him I was the hotel minibar inspector, <laughs> who had been sent to remove all the contents of his minibar for the evening, and we return next morning with some free tickets and a yellow sticky giving directions to the poetry cafe. There we go. So that's enough of that nonsense. So, so this book is an Amazon bestseller in the poetry charts. For four months, I was stuck at number two. I did television, I did radio, and I did lots of gigs. And whenever I did the gigs, it would go up. But I could never get to number one. Number one was always a dead poet. He wasn't doing any gigs, no promotions, nothing. I couldn't, just couldn't beat them. So don't buy the book yet. Wait till I die. Rush out, buy the book, and get me to number one. Okay? It was also number two in the mental health chart, because it supports mental health. And it was cognitive therapy, I think, is number one. So if you've got mental health problems, that's a, cognitive therapy is a thing to go for, by the sounds of it. And I stopped performing a little bit, because we went to Borneo to live. We went from Holland to Borneo. And there's not so much performance there. And then last year, I banged my head. And uh, I meant I couldn't walk and talk very well. Well, actually, at all, really. I couldn't walk and talk. Definitely not at the same time. And I kept forgetting things. And I couldn't work anymore. So we came back to the UK in January for that reason. And I was getting lots of physio and lots of treatment. That's why I came back. And now I can walk and talk at the same time. And now I can remember some things. And I decided, the same way as writing my book and doing my poems that helped me with my mental health, I decided I'd start performing again. Because I couldn't remember any of my poems or any of my work. So I started going to spin with the, have the open mic night and the word thing. And I've now done maybe about 20 or 30 gigs in the last couple of months. So things that I couldn't remember, I can now remember. So I would suggest to you, if ever you have any problems in your life what it, at any time, it doesn't matter what your talent is, it doesn't matter what it is that's really important to you, do the thing that's really important to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, you don't have to like these poems. Actually, I don't care. I just do it for myself. It's nice if people like it, of course, but just do the thing that's most important to yourself. You can really heal yourself from within. Okay? So I think that's my message. Heal yourself from within. If that doesn't work, drink alcohol. <laughs> now, I've got to say, I have not had a drink for four days. Right? So I'm getting very thirsty, and I'm thinking of giving in and having a glass of water. Okay, so, so <laughs> thank you very much.